passed by and they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Now, on this side of the cross, we would say, of course it withered. Jesus said it. No, I mean, listen to me. If Jesus said it, then it is so. Amen? If you have doubts whether or not what Jesus said is true, you're in the wrong building. We believe God. Amen? Then he goes on, and I love this, because he said, uh, and Jesus answered him, have faith in God. Not have faith in the pastor, not have faith in your neighbor, but have faith in God. If you're having trouble with your uh, uh, marriage relationships, don't place all your faith in your spouse. Put your faith in God who can deliver you out of those things. Amen? And I don't mean deliver you by sending him down the road. Stop it, women. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, then he goes, Jesus answered, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever, are you whoever? Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes. And here's what I want you to get before we get into our message today. But believes that what he says will come to pass. Now, why will it come to pass? Because he said it. No, I want you to get this. People say, I'm just waiting for a word from the Lord. Here's a word from the Lord. Well, I want to get divine revelation. Well, you need divine revelation of what this word says. If you're going to hear something that's never been said before, it didn't come from God. Are you listening to me? Because the Bible says this word is settled in eternity. Amen? But if he said, he, he tells me, he said, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Our words have power. Now, people say, well, uh, I hate that teaching when you think that because you say something, it's going to come to pass. Well, you may hate it, but Jesus said it. And I've been in the ministry long enough to know that there are people walking around all the time cursing themselves with their words and then wondering why their life's not working out. Well, nothing ever goes right for me. And it's hard for me as a pastor to say, nothing works out for you because you trash yourself all the time. When I say I really like me, I'm being serious. I really like me. I like me so much I spend 24 hours a day around me. <laughs> no, listen to me. God doesn't want you to hate yourself. Uh, why would he say to love your neighbor as you do yourself if you hate yourself? Maybe some of you don't get along with your neighbors because you don't like you and you don't like anybody else either. But learn to love what God has created in you. Amen? We in the flesh, and the Bible says, in the flesh lies no good thing. But what did he say, in, what did he tell us in, in Corinthians? He told the church of Corinth, he said this right here, Paul did. He said, you're acting like mere men. Why would he say mere men? Because they were acting like they didn't even know God. We're not mere men. We are people that know God. We, we are filled with the Holy Ghost and power. We have the knowledge of the Word. We have the, word, the living Word living in us. Uh, what does that do? That brings us to a place where we have to say, you know what? I'm without excuse when I jack up. That's okay. You are without excuse. Amen? But when you get to the place you say, I am going to lean solely on God. Did you know I can tell when I'm thinking a... Uh, a fleshly thought, or when I'm thinking a God sent your thought. You know why? Because I know this word. In Hebrews 4.12, you can put that up there. I love this scripture because it defines it for you. People uh, ask me a lot. They'll say, well, how in the world can I know if it's me or whether it's God? It's pretty simple. For the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of what? Soul. What is soul? Soul is mind, will, and emotions. It's my personal. It's who. It's what separates me from somebody else. If you think I'm weird, that's okay. You, I may be weird and you're not weird, but we're supposed to be different. My wife used to tell me all the time, she used to go, 
you don't think right. No, I don't think like everybody else, but I do think <laughs> part of the time. So listen to me. If you know the Word of God and you're trying to know whether or not it is a God or it's you, if you know the Word, it'll help you discern the difference between that which is soulish, mind, will, and emotions, and that which is God speaking to you. Amen? Piercing to the division of soul and of spirit of joints that merits discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I love the Word of God. If you want to hear the voice of God, you need to learn the language of God. What does this Bible do for me? It lets me understand what God's saying. In Isaiah 55, he says that, our thoughts are, uh, that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. So people have used that excuse, I can't know what God wants. Yes, you can. I may not know everything the way God does, but I know what his will is. You know how you can know an author's will? Read the author's book. That's pretty simple, isn't it? All right. I promise we'll get involved in this sermon now. So, Turn to Joshua 6. You know, it's important for me to say the right things. I still believe that when I say something that lines up with God's word, it is going to happen. If I'm going to doubt God, why would I speak it? And if I really believe God, why wouldn't I speak it? Amen? If I really believe that what God says is true, then why wouldn't I speak it? Now put Malachi up there. I told you Joshua, but you don't have to turn to Malachi. You can put it up there. Malachi 23.19. No, Numbers 23.19. I know you thought I knew everything, but I don't. If I knew everything, I wouldn't have put little notes in my Bible. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said it? And will he not do it? Or has he spoken? And will he not fulfill it? There are people that walk around, even in this church, knowing that God has made them promises. They know promises from the Word, and they know that God has told them some changes are coming by life. Can I tell you something? Those things that God planted in you, those dreams that God planted in you, they're still alive, and because He said it, understand even that Word is settled in eternity. Now it's time for you to get into agreement with what God said <laughs> Because out of the mouths of two or three witnesses shall a thing be established. Amen? So get in agreement. Don't let your dreams die. Don't, don't, don't have things that God's laid upon your heart and you say, well, it's too late for me now. I'm 71 years young, and nothing is too late for me. Amen? And inside right now, we know God cannot lie. He's laid some things in our heart. Some of them are spiritual things. Some things are physical things that deal with this world. Changes need to come about in our own life. And we know that God has set this in our hearts. And yet sometimes if God says it, who will come against it? Satan will. And he'll use people to come and talk to you. Well, you shouldn't do that. Well, don't do that. I mean, before I went into the ministry, when I started to get into ministry, the truth about it is, is that there were lots of people that knew me from my past that didn't think I should even attempt it. But I got a hold of one thing, and that is this right here. If God said it, it'll happen. I don't even have to know all the ways that it's going to happen. And some of you know what I'm talking about, that God laid something on your heart, so you say, well, I can do that. I'll go do it. Let God pull this thing together for you. You know why? You're not smart enough. <laughs> He's the all-knowing God. He knows what it takes to accomplish the thing that he 
called you to do. You feel, though, and you guys can admit this because I know it's true. I feel it, and I know you feel it, too. You feel like there's a change coming in the spiritual realm, a real change coming. I've known some people over the years that are, that are pretty hard in their hearts, and even, then, even they, at this today, their hearts are kind of getting softer. God's reaching out, touching them. He's, he's telling you, you may feel like I'm done with you. I'm not done with you. I got a plan for you. Well, God, do you know how much I've messed up? You ain't messed up more than what I can fix. Amen? I don't give up on anybody. I want you to say that. I don't give up on anybody. Man, I'm telling you. You got a promise. You got a promise from God, and that's all you need. I just need a promise from God, and I can stand upon that promise. And when the enemy comes against me, and other people come against me and say, well, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, no, no, no. I, I, I want to say, unless you're God, you need to be quiet, because I'm going to listen to what God said. Amen? Everyone say, good morning, Jeff. A promise from God is all you need. A promise from God is all you need. Abraham had a promise. And Isaac was born. When? When Abraham was 100 years old. And his wife was, what, 99? 90? And you heard how Abraham acted. So you're going to give me a sign, I'm 100 years old. Have you seen that old woman I'm married to? <laughs> She's older than dirt. Well, I paraphrase some of that. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality of it is because that which seems impossible in the natural is perfect for God to do. It might seem impossible in your mind, but if God spoke it, it is possible. We're talking about Jesus, the one that walked on water. It was one of my favorite times when I was crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat. And the storm rose up. And it just seemed, the other people were getting kind of afraid because the storm rose up. And the boat was, I thought, no, it's perfect. It's just time for God to say, peace, be still. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so. But I'm going to tell you, uh, when you get to the place in your life where you trust your life, to God wherever you are did you know that you don't have to get out of your mess on your own God gets in the middle of your mess and he'll pull you out of it if you'll just do what he says he'll pull you out of your mess let me tell you something when he said let there be light he already knew you were going to be a mess he hadn't created the first man he looked down through time and said man you're going to be a mess but I'm going to come along and I'm going to get you out of that mess. Because that's who God is. Amen? Hallelujah. Moses led the children of Israel out. He had a promise. Now, do you know what he tried to do first? He tried to handle things on his own, so he killed one of the, one of the Egyptians. What? What do you think? He was going to kill the whole of Egypt? That's how he was going to deliver the people out? No, no. He, he was like most of us. He got a promise from God. Now he's going to do it. Man. But look how he delivered the people, uh, out, the people of Israel out of the Pharaoh's hand once he decided to let God be God in that situation. And it is absolutely true that every one of the plagues that came represented one of the gods of Israel. So the very gods of Israel, what the Egyptians, not gods of Israel, but the gods of Egypt. And so what happened was in the midst of it, what did he see? Everyone got to see that the gods that they'd been worshiping in, in, in Egypt were the very ones it looked like were turning on them and destroying their land. I love God. He does miraculous things. And you're not going to figure out how he did it. You don't have to figure out how he does. You just need to trust him. And have faith. Amen? Joseph had a promise, remember? Remember the dream that Joseph had? And he told his parents about it. And, 
And uh, they said, so shall we also bow and worship at you? And, you know, that, it's all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and then he, all this great promise, and he's thrown into a pit. Then he's sold into slavery. Then he ends up in prison. In every place that, that he ended up, God prospered the people where he was and prospered him. You don't have to figure it out. You've got to decide whose side are you on. I think I'll be on God's side. What do you think? You've got a promise that there's going to be a change in your life. I don't ever have a service where somebody doesn't come up to me and it's okay, you can talk to me anytime. But they'll come up to me and say, boy, I'm really going through something. Can I tell you something? When you're going through something, it's not the end. It's not the end. You're not the first person to go through something. Well, my emotions are all awry. I'm not a good counselor. I'm just telling you that. When people come up to me and say, I've been doing something I shouldn't do, well, stop it. There's my counseling for you. I've been doing a lot of things I shouldn't do. Well, don't do them anymore. What am I saying? Get on God's side. Decide it's not a question anymore. I'm going to be a man of integrity. I'm going to love the Lord. I'm going to take care of my family. I've been married to my wife for 42 years, and she is my life. And I don't want you to get upset when I tell you this, but if I ever had to choose between my wife and this church, I'd choose my wife. <laughs> Amen? If I had to choose between this church and my family, I'll choose my family. Amen? And I also want to tell you, you that know her number, call her. She's going to be mad at me if she knows I'm telling you this. But call her. Because with the problem she has thinking right now, it's, she doesn't want to be around people. But she comes to church with me most of the time. But can I tell you something? I still want people to pursue her. Does that make sense? I know you have busy lives. Most of the time I'm with her, 99 hours out of 100 hours, I'm with her anyway. She's been doing better. She goes to hospital visits with me and stuff like that. I love it. But call her up. If you get her on the phone, just tell her, just want to let tell you I, I love you and I know that you're going through a lot, but I'm praying for you and, and we're all getting better. Whatever you God lays on your heart. Amen? Amen. All right, I'll stop there. But, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, the people that the Holy Ghost can know. Well, it doesn't say it that way, but it does. What? Nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. They used to say those at funerals all the time, like it's about being dead. It's not about being dead. But it goes like this. These things God has revealed. Say, God has revealed them. God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. You have the Holy Spirit living on the inside, and He knows the very depths of God, and He'll reveal those things to you when you open yourself up to the Lord and allow Him to speak to you. Man, if right now you say, God, speak to me, I'll do what you want me to. God, I'm a righteous man. You know what the Bible says, uh, the righteous man's steps are ordered to the Lord. Can I tell you, if you know the Lord here today, every one of you is considered righteous in his sight through the blood of Christ. When he speaks to you, follow him. Do what he says. If you follow the flesh, you'll get what the flesh gets. If you follow the Spirit, you'll get what the Spirit gets. I heard a man say this one time, and it sounded pretty braggadocious at the time, but I'll kind of say it if I can figure it out how he said it, but I heard this preacher say, uh, I don't worry about uh, having what God has. Uh, I'm more concerned with being who God is. Because if I can be who Jesus is, then I can have what he has. I said, that's a pretty good thing, isn't it? Now, we're talking about riches and all that kind of stuff. Those are the least things in this world, aren't they? But do you think that Jesus is beside this father right up there worried about anything? 
Come on. Is Jesus worried about anything? If Jesus isn't worried about anything, why should we be? He holds this world in the palm of his hand. Remember that old song? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got silly preachers. No, I'm just not. <laughs> you have a promise from God. Now, we're, we're going to look at this in the sixth chapter. Now, Jericho was shut up. I'm not going to read every verse of them. I'm going to read the ones I want to. You know the story. But uh, Now, Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. What does that mean? It was just like the candy factory in Willy Wonka. Oh, no, that. And the Lord. <laughs> and the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have. Say, I have. Yes. See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. Now, look at that statement for what it is. In the natural, Joshua wouldn't be able to see that. But in the spiritual, God is calling him to see that God has already delivered Jericho into his hand. Now, before I go too much further, I want you to realize that, that even though they're going to march around, they're going to blow the trumpet, and the walls are going to fall, people say, oh, then God took care of it all. No, he didn't. Did you know they still had to go into that city and subdue it? The walls fell down. The thing separating them from the very dream that God had given them. The walls kept them from going, but God only did part of it. Can I remind you of that? When you're living life, you see God move in a miraculous way, and it seems like there's something else. Yeah, what he did was prepare the way so you could get something done. Somebody asked me, why was it important for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you know why? I mean, for us to be cleansed. Because the Holy Spirit couldn't fill us until we were cleansed. The Holy Spirit doesn't move into an imperfect vessel. You got that? If you got Lord Jesus in your life, you've been cleansed. And the Holy Spirit could come in and guide you and lead you where you need to go in life. Where he needs you to go in life. Amen? See, I've given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men of valor. Now, now listen. You can see your destiny when you get in touch with God. I remember the day when I knew I was going to be a preacher. I was reading the word through every month, 40 chapters a day, and I was in Romans, and it said, how shall they know unless there be a preacher? And that thing just slapped me upside my head. <laughs> I didn't want to be a preacher. I even argued with God about it. I know that I've been cleansed, God. I've seen your word, but still, I was an addict, an alcoholic, violent man. You got somebody else to do this that's going to be better than I will at it. And I remember when a man came to preach at our church, and I was talking to him later on. I said, you know what? The only thing this, this church really needs is a better pastor. And you know what he told me? He said, oh, so you think God is a fool. I said, what? I didn't say anything bad about God. Oh, yeah, you did. Because God's not a fool. If he had somebody else he wanted in there, he'd have put them in there. But he put you in there because you're the best for the people that he's bringing to that place. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You, I, couldn't, I couldn't preach in some of them great big churches. I could grab the Bible and preach, but they, they'd look at me saying, what is that Hanyak doing up there, you know? <laughs> but I was perfect for this congregation. Amen? Amen? You can praise God now, right now, with just a promise that he's given you. This is one of the things we learn from this group of scriptures. You praise God right now. I praise God for the things that he's doing inside of my life and I praise God for the fulfilled promise 
that he's made in my life. I praise him for those things. Some of you struggle still today because you think you've got to figure it all out and get it all done. But I'm just telling you, you don't have the ability to do all that. But there's a position that is one of God's favorite positions. You know what it is? It's when you humble yourself, get on your knees, talk to God, and finally admit you can't do it. I, I can't do it, God. God, if you want me to preach, you better do it because I can't do it. And my mind was burnt enough back when I first got saved that it was hard for me to form whole conversations. It may sound like I still have that problem, but, but I'm better than I was. But yeah, believe God. Believe Him. When He sets a, a promise or a vision or a dream on the inside of you, start getting excited about it and praising Him for it now. Because let me tell you this, you don't really believe it if you can't praise him for it now before it's manifested. Amen. I was praying for somebody years ago that was had some real problem with their hips. And uh, I was at that church preaching and stuff, and they came up. I got a real problem with my hips. I said, well, God's going to touch you and heal you today. And uh, he said, how do you know? Because well, the Bible says so. Did well, God tell you that? No, the Bible told me so. That is God talking to me. And so I prayed for him. He said, okay. Not okay. Praise him right now. And so he started praising him with very sickly praise. I thought, man, what is that? So he started shouting. And I got him to shouting. And then I got him to dancing. And he started dancing. And all of a sudden it hit him that his hip felt fine. Yeah. I said, yeah, because you need to praise God for the promise right now before you see the manifestation it's not faith to believe that someday this is going to happen faith is to believe it because God spoke it it's good it's happening right now yes. amen, amen. <laughs> see I've given you Jericho I love it God makes promises for your life he makes promises about your children Today, I want to say you may have children that are acting up and you can't figure out what in the world happened. I tried to raise them, right? Why are they acting that way? It, but let me tell you something. When God gives you a promise, and I tell people this all the time, well, I feel like the Lord told me my kid's going to straighten up. Then guess what? He is going to straighten up. Amen? You might be going like this. said, you know what? My car is so broken down. that I can't. You know what? Start believing for another car. God don't want you broke down. He don't want you to have to get to work by going. <laughs> I was hitchhiking with my, my brother around the country one day, and, and uh, he said, let's start walking. I said, why? Well, they'll still see us and stop. I said, it's 100 miles to the next town. I'm not walking 100 miles. If they're going to pick me up, they'll see me here before I am down there two miles. <laughs> I want to praise God for, for his promises right now. Not some other time. Right now. I believe God now. You got relationships that are, that are hurting you, but the point is you're the one staying in a relationship that's harmful. Amen? Well, I... It, will God touch my spouse? Yes. But not if you, all you do is sit around and complain about your spouse. But if you'll talk to God and confess the word over your spouse and start believing God, he can bring changes to anything that you're in. I'm hearing this right now. So I'm just going to say this real quick. Uh, I don't know who this is for, but I just want to say it. The Lord wants you to know he knows that you're weary and that you know the word, but you're just weary. You're just struggling through all this stuff. And he knows it, and he's heard your heart's cry. 
Now stand up for him. Make that decision. I know people in this church, all they want to do is talk about their past. Please don't be offended by this. I don't give a rat's behind about your past. We're living in the present. Amen? I'm living in the present. And if my words have power, that when, I, when my word lines up with his... And I told you this story a long time ago when I was praying. I said, you know, it's not that I don't believe this, but God, my words, what's my words? He said, if I spoke out of a rock, a creative word, would it have to happen? If you want to create something, it's going to create, even if you're speaking out of a rock. He said, if I spoke out of a tree for something to happen, would it happen? I said, yeah, you're God. He goes, what if I put my words in your mouth? Will it happen? Yes. Some of you are struggling because you don't make that final decision. I'm done trying to handle things myself. I'm done trying to figure everything out. And God, I'm going to follow you no matter what my circumstances say. I'm going to believe you, God. God, no matter what my circumstances say, I'm going to get a hold of your word. And I'm going to confess what your word says about my circumstances. I told somebody one time, they said, you know, under the circumstances, Pastor, well, don't be there. Get over your circumstances. So we're going to go down. I'm not going to go through every this thing, but I want you to go down to the 15th verse, Joshua 6. And on the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you this city. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about faith. Getting to a place where you really believe God, no matter where you are in life, where you, you know if you can shout. People don't want to shout. They, don't want to, they want to shout when they get angry. How about shout for God? How about shouting out the things that you're believing for, standing on? Sometimes you need to get a little noisy. Sometimes you need to go, God, the, the doctor says this is the end for me. But God, your word says with long life will you satisfy me. Yes, Shout it. Yes. Devil, I hope you're listening to me right day. That even though the doctor says my wife cannot be healed of dementia, I thank you right now, God, that you are still the healer. Yes. Not just of a few things, but everything. Yes. When you get to the place that you're in a place of where you'll shout what you know God wants in your life and you quit trying to live to the flesh, you'll find a big difference coming in your life. Oh, there's a change. Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for the destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who will her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom he sent. But now watch you, I want you to get this. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction. Oh, that's a powerful birth. There are a lot of things in this world that really have no consequence at all. They're not from God, and they're destroying people all the time. The Bible says don't devote yourself to that. Don't do that. They are set for destruction. But you're set for life, aren't you? Amen? Uh, put up 2 Timothy 2, 4, please. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. What's the next verse say after that? An athlete is not crowned unless he complete, competes according to the rules. Listen to me. You can't get tangled up in the things of this life where they become more important to you than the things of God. I've had even people argue with me about this when I say, you know what? God means more to me than my family, than my, than my wife or my kids. God's more important to me than that. Not the church, but God. More important to me than anyone or anything on this earth. He has to be number one. Jesus has to be number one in your life. That's God's plan for your life, that he be number one. 
He is supposed to replace anything else in your life. He said, but you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them to take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing of destruction and bring trouble upon it. Uh, let me tell you something. When you get a promise from God, oh, when you get a promise from God, you don't need evidence to support it. I don't need evidence to support what God tells me. I don't need it. I know the rapture's coming, and I tease about it sometimes. I'll go, guess what? I feel lighter already. But in reality, I don't have to feel lighter because His Word said it's coming. Amen? If you're always looking for proof of the promises of God, you'll miss a lot. His word is the proof. Your faith in his word is the proof. Amen? He's the promise keeper. Let's go to Romans 4. We're going to talk about Abraham for a moment. Because when I ask you to believe God and confess the things of God, uh, Abraham was pretty good at that. Now, he argued with God the first time he told him, you're going to have a kid. What did God do? I love it. First time he argued with God, what did he do? God took him out and showed him all the stars in heaven. He said, your seed shall be greater than all of this. Amen. Amen. When you live to the flesh, you'll die to the flesh. When you live for the spirit, you'll live. Satan would like to come along and kill you today. Can I tell you that? Did you know he's smart enough to know all he can do is kill your flesh, but he can't kill your spirit? I talked to somebody that, that lost a loved one this morning, and I told him, did you know that, that God could, I mean, that Satan came and killed his flesh, but God received his spirit? Amen. In Romans, the fourth chapter, starting the 13th verse. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law. That's an important thing. Another way to say this is this right here. I could say it like this. Uh, uh, for the promise of Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir to the world did not come through his own effort. But through the righteousness of faith. His faith was counted as righteousness. When you say, I believe you, God. I believe. I believe. For if it is the adherents to the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and promise is void. For the law brings... I said this to somebody the other day. For the law brings... Did I say it to you, dogger? For the law brings wrath. This is one of the most important verses in the Bible. I want you to get this. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. Think about the depth of that for a second. And what does that mean? Well, it means what it says. Since I'm not under the law, there's no way I can break a law that I'm not under. Well, what's that mean? Well, it's like this. If I wanted to go... 150 miles an hour down a highway that has no, no law on it. There is, by the way, a highway like that in Nevada. But anyway, if, if you go as fast as you can on that highway, did you know if they pulled you over, they can't pull you over and say, you're breaking the speed limit. Why? There is no speed limit. When you come up to a Christian, I want you to get a hold of this. We are led by the Holy Spirit, not by the law. I told somebody this the other day. I said, did you know there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter? And it's very interesting because he said, until this day, with the reading of the Old Testament, a veil comes across the, the, the eyes of the reader. Can you look at up 2 Corinthians? 
I'm not saying it exactly right. You think I do everything right, but you guys are dead wrong about that. When somebody said, boy, I'd like to act just like you, I said, I, can, I do live a pretty good example for people. I'm telling you, I do. But if you follow me around, Leroy, do you remember this? Do you remember the time where you was in my room and I dropped that little three-pound sledge on my, my toe in my deal and I cussed? <laughs> Pastor, I said, if you don't like it, you better hope I don't drop it on the other foot. <laughs> We're not loved by, God, loved by God because we don't make mistakes. We're loved by God because he cleansed us of everything we'd ever do. But their minds were hardened. For to this, to this day, now watch this, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. People that say, I only, I only read the Old Testament, then your understanding and your eyes are veiled from what Christ can do. I read the Old Testament. I just read a little bit of Joshua. I read the Old Testament. But I, I, I understand that the Old Testament tells me about promises and gives examples, but Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. When he said, Tetelestai, he, said, he was saying paid in full when he said that from the cross. Say, my sins have been paid for in full. Oh, I'm glad of that. I know you guys are glad a bunch of sinners you are, but anyway. Oh, I'm sorry. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there's no transgression. God established Abraham's promise in heaven before it ever manifested on the earth. What God has promised me is a done thing in heaven. Even though it all hasn't been manifested here yet, it will happen. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his offspring. Not only to the adherents of the law, but also the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who the father of us all. Why? The promise is there. What, what did we read before? In Galatians 3, it says the same thing. If you, be in, if, if you be in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and a joint heir to the promise. Are you glad about that? Yeah. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. If you're getting tired, I'll be done here in just a minute. I shouldn't hold you more than an hour or so. We, we, no. Now... As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. See, if only you're living by the flesh, you'll look for things that you can see rather than believe that when God says it, it's an absolute truth. Does that make sense? In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he'd been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith. Say, I will not, I will not. Weaken, in weaken in faith. When he considered his own body, which was good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, Sarah's womb no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. This is the key to you achieving the very best things. Nothing in this world can make you waver. Nothing. What did he say in James about a person that wavers? He's like a wave that's tossed in the sea. Amen. And the Bible says, let not that man believe he'll receive anything from the Lord. I'm not going to waver in faith. I'm going to stand and believe. When all the things in the natural say something else, I don't care. God. God is truth. And I can believe his word because even Jesus in the 17th chapter of the book of John, when he was praying, he said about the disciples, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Say, the, God's, word God's word is truth, is truth. All, the all the time, in every circumstance, in every time. Are you glad about that? 
No belief, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith. He gave, his glo gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was... But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It would be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses, raised for our justification. Believing. Even before the walls fell, God gave Joshua the belief that when God said, I've given this city to you, Jericho, the king, and the mighty men in it, I've given them to you. And then he gave them a ridiculous plan. Keep marching around there, and on the seventh day you walk around, and then walk around seven times, and then shout. Now, I don't care who you are. If your commander gave you a, 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 <laughs> an instruction like that, listen, we're going to defeat this place. Here's how we're going to do it. <laughs> we're going to walk around this place seven times. And he told them not to say a word. Do you know why he told them not to say a word? Because what are people like? They'll speak doubt. If he hadn't told them to be silent, they would walk around here and say, did you hear what he said? Isn't that ridiculous? What's wrong with that guy? Walk around here. You know, we're looking like fools to those people on the other side of that wall. Just walking around here. I bet they're afraid. Oh, they're walking. <laughs> it had to seem pretty ridiculous. So he told them not to talk. And then, huh, he said on the seventh day, you're going you're gonna to walk around at seven times. There's going to be the blasting of the horns. And then guess what? You're going to give a shout. And when they were obedient to that shout, the walls fell down as if they'd never been built there. And now it was time for their army to go in and defeat that city. I'm telling you, God's plan, who can figure that out? I can't figure it out. I can't figure it out, but I'm glad that anything he says is always true. When you shout your faith, shouts. Silence the enemy. No, no, you try it. You get frustrated, get a hold of the word, walk outside your house and prove to your neighbors that you are crazy. <laughs> Start shouting. And I believe you, God. No matter what this world looks like, I believe you, God, you're going to come and rescue us because your word says so. I'm saved because your word says so. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Your word says so. I'm healed because your word says so. I'm delivered because your word says so. I've been set on a straight path because your word says. I was brought out of my clay and put on a solid rock because your word says. No matter what this world looks like, I'm going to shout, man. I'm going to shout my faith. Amen? Amen. There's something I help you with. I love doing that. They should never put me in front of somebody, should they? Are you about done with your little private conversation? Yes. Okay. It's pertinent. It's pertinent. She probably had that set up. You're going to have to deliver me after so much time. So I could get... No, I'm just messing with you. Fall in love with this. Fall in love with this word. If you'll have fallen in love with the word, you'll be a mighty worker for God. In the midst of when everybody else is running helter-skelter, looking like they don't understand what's going on, you'll know the truth. And don't be afraid to speak the truth because right now, when people say, nobody wants to hear about God today, you're wrong. People have never been as hungry for the Lord as they are right now. If you get out and speak it, it'll make a tremendous difference. You know, I lead a lot of people to Jesus. 
But I don't just lead them here. I lead them when I go to the hospitals. I lead them when I'm out on the streets. I lead people to Jesus in restaurants. You, why? Because you don't ever stop talking about Jesus, do you? Amen? We walked in a restaurant one time, Debbie and I did, and this gal just, I heard her complained about something. I said, can I have your hand for just a moment? And she put her hand in my hand. Can I pray for you? Because I want to tell you, your life is so precious to God. And when I started talking to her, tears started coming out of her eyes. And I said, did you know that of all the people I have talked to today, God said, you're the most important. Can I talk to you about Jesus? People are so receptive to that now. They're tired of people just preaching at them. They want to know that somebody really, really cares. Amen. We're going to shout our faith, ain't we? Amen. We're going to see the walls come down. God's going to deliver these cities to us. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Say, shout, shout it. Shout, shout it. it. Shout. I'm going to shout my faith. Shout. I, believe you, I believe you, God. I'm not led by my circumstances. I'm led by you, Lord. I'm on your side. You're on my side forever. forever. Amen. You received that from the pastor this morning. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to put a little water on this desert tongue of mine. I don't want to end this without an opportunity for you. I want some of my leaders to come forward here. When we do this, we do this for a reason. Not because we know that we're the answer. We know we're not the answer. But Jesus is. Whatever struggle you're having inside of your life, did you know that, uh, man, you need prayer and you need to confess your healing before God? Amen? This is your time. This isn't about us. All the people up here have been instructed not to get into long prayers about something. How many times do you find Jesus praying for an hour to heal somebody? Be healed. not a mystery he's the healer amen? amen whatever struggle goes on inside of your life he cares about it because he came to heal the brokenhearted the Bible says and bind up their wounds this is your time that's the message of today this is your time not some other time you're not waiting for some other time this is your time you're going to rise up and accomplish the things that God called you to, no matter what the circumstances look like. You're going to rise up. God's on your side. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. While he's playing, come on up here and get some prayer. We love you. We care about you. We love you more than peanut butter. And I'm crazy about peanut butter. Amen. Hallelujah. You have trouble with your marriage? Guess what? God, you know, somebody said, we, we're going to come forward so you can lay hands on us for our marriage. I can lay hands on your head till you're bald. <laughs> but unless you love her the way that Christ loves the church and she esteems you the way that God esteems the church. Amen. Well, that's nice. Thank you. I get all kinds of little gifts up here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love talking about Jesus. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. For I found in him a friend. So kind and true. I would tell you how he saved my life completely. He did something that no other friend 
could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no one but he else so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and sorrow from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. He loves you. He loves you so much. When I say he loves you, did you know what your response should always be? I love him back. He loves you, just love him back. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, people, the kids hand me stuff like this. I hang it on my refrigerator until I have to clean it off sooner or later. You know what I'm saying? But, but I really like all the things I get from you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, they're still praying. Let's sing the song we always do. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Oh, Lord, won't you to help me? Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Help me on my journey, Lord, help me on my way. Oh, Lord. I want you to help me while I'm praying, Lord. While I'm praying, I want you to help me. While I'm praying, I want you to help me. Help me on my journey, Lord, help me on my way. Oh, Lord, won't you to help me? You know why waiting is important? It's because God doesn't do everything on my time, and he does on his timing. And sometimes I'm impatient. My wife will tell you that. Or when I'm driving so much, I get in traffic, I, wouldn't, I don't yell at people, but I go like this. <coughs> <laughs> I want to yell, what does green light mean? <laughs> oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Help me on my journey, Lord, help me on my way. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me while I'm waiting. While I'm waiting, I want you to help me. While I'm waiting. I want you to help me. Help me on my journey, Lord, help me on my way. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Man, I get up every morning and know I need his help. Amen? Yeah. I need his help. And he's always, always, always faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13 says that when we're faithless, he's faithful. Even though I mess things up, guess what? He'll never mess it up. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's just raise our hands and say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, receive the word. I receive the word. It's come into good soil. My heart is open. Lord, have your way in my life. I believe in your promises. 
And I'll speak them. I'll shout them. I believe them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we'll take up communion. God is good. Give him a clap offering, would you? He's good. He's faithful. Amen. I only had about 50 Bibles, buddy, so I had to buy me another. This is, <laughs> this is a goat. This is a goat cover. It's a preaching Bible, so you can hold it like this. You can be, you know, Swing it around, go like this. Oh, sorry about our private conversation. You did. Hallelujah. We're going to take communion. Well, you did good, Nevaeh. All right, let me get my stuff. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. You know, the Bible always makes sense, don't it? It just makes sense. Hey, Jeff, you know music. Come here. So you probably can tell me the meaning of any song. There's a song that goes like this. I built my house from barley rice, green pepper walls and water ice, tables of paper wood, windows of light, and everything empty into white. A sad blue-eyed drummer rehearses outside, a black spider dancing on top of his eye, a red-legged chicken stands ready to strike, and everything ends into white. Cat Stevens. <laughs> so if you tell me what that means, let me know. <laughs> Hey, get off the steroids, buddy. No, I'm just no. I would try to puff up, but there's nothing to puff up. Oh. Hey, lead them in communion, would you? We need some help here. We got somebody in trouble here. All right. If you got your bread, lift it up. I promise I took communion at the 8 o'clock. Don't get mad at me. My hands were busy. Say it with me. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. It is for my healing, my spouse's healing. My children's healing. Thank you that by your stripes, by the beatings you bore, by the lashes which fell on your back, we are completely healed. I believe and I receive. Take and eat. Take the cup. Say it with me. Thank you, Jesus, for the new covenant cut in your blood. Your blood has brought me forgiveness, washed me from every sin. I thank you that your blood has made me righteous. And as I drink, I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, 
which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and prosperity. Thank you, Jesus. As Pastor Bob likes to say, you know what it says in the book of James, that with his tongue, we often bless God and curse man, my brother, and it ought not to be so. So I'm going to go ahead, say a quick prayer, speak a blessing, we'll be on our merry way. Father, thank you so much for who you are and how you love us. Thank you for bringing us here to hear the word that you have given Pastor Bob to give to us. We thank you that it is good seed scattered into good soil, that it will take root and bear fruit in our lives, that as we go from here, we're going to look more like Jesus in everything we say and do and act and think in Jesus' name. May grace and truth be multiplied to you in the true knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and I speak a blessing on everyone here in the six major areas of life, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Father, pour out your love, your power, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they will say, surely these people have been with Jesus. If you receive that, say amen. Amen. That is wonderful to hear. I love you all more than chocolate. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Have a fantastic week. God bless you. We'll see you next time.